<laughs> Where are we, wifey? We're at Chigsy Medieval Festival. Yeah. Oh. How many times have we been here now? Like four or five times? I don't know. Something yeah, loads, like that. We? About 20 times, maybe? <laughs> no. They all once a year. <laughs> We've, we've only missed three, so we've been about six times now. I mean, I, I came here when I was like ten. Well, you, that doesn't count, I went together. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, yeah, re about, re recent history. About six times. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a good event. Yeah. And you can see the wing of the Earl of Devon processing in front of you. <coughs> with a magnificent saffron-coloured plume jutting from his helmet, the commander of the Lancastrian left. This, of course, makes him much more visible on the field. You know you're looking out for the yellow plume, then you know where you're heading for. To her right-hand side, her young son, 18 years old, Edward, Prince of Wales, burning to avenge the humiliation done to his family, and this day to slaughter his opponents and win the crown for himself. And in the body of men behind them, the slippery Lord Wedlock, who's going to be with them in the centre of the army, anchoring that, the man who, changing sides, is the obvious stratagem of politics. And behind them, in turn, the troops of the Earl of Somerset, that reckless gambler who first persuaded Margaret to stay in England to fight. Anjou! 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 The war cry you hear there, Anjou! Anjou! is that of Queen Margaret's bodyguard. Some of the bravest soldiers in Europe, they're Frenchmen who've come to a strange country to protect a woman who they honour and love. And you'll see a, a break in the line of Lancastrian troops, and those of you on the right will have before you the tall, proud figure of the Earl of Somerset, the Duke of Somerset himself. Magnificent in his moustache and the arms of the Beaufort family on his surcoat and behind him his blue and white clad followers drawn from the West Country. A towering figure of a man. A man full of courage, full of daring, full of loyalty, full of romance and not terribly full of brains. And on the left-hand side of the battlefield, right-hand side of the battlefield, as we're facing it at the moment, uh, there's a, a lot of very shiny stuff going on. I think this is maybe where the Yorkists have actually uh, arrived and they have dug in. And uh, who has it got the higher ground? Who has it got the better position for this one? The better position was Lancaster. And therefore, what the Yorkists would need to do, ideally, would more and more of the space on the far right of the field is filling up with armed men. And like a field of silver poppies, so many will be cut down in their prime. The number of deaths from this battle mustn't go forgotten. These are stocky, stolid, dependable noblemen who are good anchor figures for a wing. And those of you on the far right can see the royal standard of England being carried in, with the figure of King Edward himself pacing in front of it. Tall, muscular, with a magnificent red and gold and blue surcoat with the royal arms of England upon it, striding forth in front of his men, social equal, not to a sovereign. And Edward has shoved the prince, and the prince pushes him back. They've come to blows already. Clearly this was never going to... Oh, and the queen is... Oh! oh. She will for France, they go. From here. And Edward's just boxed the prince, and the prince has thumped him on his midriff. This is not chivalric behaviour. Very far from it. 
Well, that's it. We've come to insults. And there is the fog of battle, fortunately dispersing on the field before it reaches our lines. So both our throats and our tummies are going to be okay. The suits of armour can weigh anything up to nine stones. Castrians are standing firm. They're using their own acrobusias as they were very well paid and very valued. The whole thing is to have a good campaign and then return. Gurneys, or the artillery pieces, are actually a weapon of terrible fear as well as of destruction. And now the Lancastrian army has decided that it's going to test the Yorkists. The entire army of Margaret of Anjou is moving forward as they hope to the kill. Heading right to the far side of the field, aiming to punch a hole in the Yorkist line and end the battle immediately. I might add, for those of you on the far left of the field, that the battle will swing to and fro today. So don't feel cheated if the action is going to be on the front, on the right side, for a while. Cat, something's gone badly wrong. Where? Most of the Lancastrian line has halted. The Earl of Devon's got his men far too far back. Margaret of Anjou stopped her men, and the, Earl of, the Duke of Somerset has decided to launch an attack single-handed upon Richard, Duke of Gloucester's wing. One thing you don't do is break your army into pieces. And the impetuous Duke of Somerset, and win the battle himself and all the honour with it. It's an incredibly risky thing. I wonder whether he was expecting Wenlock to bring this... rather hard to get a, a straight story out of this. But certainly the disaster has occurred. Yeah. The Lancastrian army is now in three pieces and only one third of it's engaged. But it's doing its best. Somerset's men are heroes. And unsupported, they're trying very hard to roll up the Yorkist army. And you can hear that kettle-mending noise of steel against steel about which the romantic poets wax so lyrically. And whether it's not too late, and it is too late because Absolutely. the Somerset wing is now withdrawing having failed completely and to break a, through. Sorry. There's a phrase called withdrawing in good order and that's not in good order, that's ragged, that's a body of men who are, they're not actively retreating but it's close. No, and, and I can see that Somerset is purple in the face, not just with heat but with rage shouting his name. Clearly what's happened now is Somerset has blamed Wedlock yes. for not coming to support him. I think my supposition was possibly correct. It was indeed, although Somerset's impetuosity. And here the young Prince of Wales is leading forward his men to hit King Ooh. Edward's centre while it's static. That was brutal. Yes, that was, that was also very brave and the Lancastrian centre moving up to engage the Yorkists. And on the far side of the field, the Earl of Devon is sweeping like a great wave against Hastings' troops. The Lancastrians are determined to keep the initiative, but they're still keeping a rear guard to the left, and Somerset's men, like Richard of Gloucester's, are resting and recuperating on the lines nearest to us. Well, Richard of Gloucester's troop, remember, had back up from the cavalry which came swinging out of the trees, so they haven't got as much recuperation to do because they had the upper hand in that particular part of the engagement. They have indeed, and they'll have a vastly better opinion of their leader than Somerset's men. Somerset's doing what he does best now, which is throw a tantrum and blame everybody else. Lancaster's gamble hasn't worked. You can see the Prince of Wales division in the centre fighting desperately and bravely but being pushed back. <clears throat> and on the far side, uh, Devon's wing is still holding Hastings there that hasn't managed to get through. 
The Lancastrian army is now forming a rather ragged diagonal across the field, which again is not terribly good military form. As far as battles go, this is very, very untidy. Even though medieval fighting was often done in groups, in battle, such as this, it's not normally this much of a mess. To close up in a good, proper line with the rest of the Yorkist army, and either challenge Lancaster to another advance or to go to the advance themselves. The king is withdrawing his men in the centre, including the Irish, to close up again and try and make a proper, strong, straight battle line. And as the Earl of Devon's men retreat on the far side of the field, it looks as if Lancaster is trying to do exactly the same. Now this is starting to look a bit more how a battle should. Or do you charge yourself and take the advantage of momentum and morale in smashing at the enemy? Turn under Wedlock and the Prince and the one nearest us, the right under Somerset, are more or less coordinating except that once again it's Somerset's wing that's pushing to the fourth, so they're not coordinated. That's not going to improve Somerset's move with Wenlock any, is it? No. And so there's this curious sort of balance, once you're in there in the scrum, between being careful not actually to land any injury on the people you're fighting, and yet at the same time not allowing them to beat you too easily. There's a matter of pride involved here. Oh, there's an immense amount of pride in there. <coughs> and an immense amount of respect for what we're representing as well. It isn't just a case of going out and bashing and ha ha ha. The history means a lot to all of the men out here. <clears throat> Save that, we all know by now what a bad temper he has. Splendid moustache, though. Oh, no, he's hurt. He's going in? He's now going in, yes. He's, the penny has dropped. He knows he has to do some fighting. He's wielding a pole axe, an axe on the end of uh, a long half, with a sharp bit sticking out of the end, and using it pretty well. The centre there, Lancastrian centre, just pulling back. I think I can see a set of plumes heading down the field that way. And suddenly, King Edward's leading a charge oh dear. right into the centre of the Lancastrian army, punching through the gap that has opened in it and the entire Yorkist army is following him. This is a coordinated attack with a stab right at the enemy's heart. A classic battlefield tactic for the first time in this battle. So we're now all going to see everybody engaged. Margaret of Anjou is withdrawing wisely towards the rear. Her son is not. He's right there in the center of everything. Right flank just advancing. Oh, it's the archers, I do apologise. The right flank are engaged. Oh, 
And we know that uh, in the actual Battle of Tewkesbury, some of the Lancastrians, around about this point, got the idea that the battle wasn't quite going to go their way. And we know that there were some who tried to escape off the field and uh, were cut down in vast numbers, or indeed who drowned in the Severn. On the far side of the field, loosing our volleys against each other, firing over the heads of the men at arms between. And Lancaster is disengaging in good order. And the York is falling back in front. So Edward's gambit has failed. And I see small bodies of uh, champions coming. Yes, and I see the first pair of matched combatants coming to fight with each other. Yes, and the rest. The people you in the center can see fighting between the armies at this point are not only representatives of the champions of their armies in 1471, they're actually the best swordsmen of the reenactors themselves, people who are adept in using these weapons and without causing injury, defeating opponents. So in that sense, what you're seeing are real contests. You see the speed and accuracy, and in some, some cases, the brutality. I'm looking straight in front of me at the red and the silver at the moment. They're literally having to reshape their swords on the field. Oh, that is... Yeah, it's good. It's a uh, brutality. Uh, we give you bread and circuses and blood and guts and uh, gun smoke, horses. Where else can you get a day out like this? And what's really good is the fact that both sides are cheering on their own champions. The field is now Ooh. littered with wounded men. They're not looking too clever, are they? No. Oh! I'm never sure the spinning round is a particularly good move. Usually by they're getting shot right in the bum. Rather impressively, the pair who fought longest are still at it, and the Yorkist has just obtained the surrender of the Lancastrian. It's rather lovely, instead of dispatching him, he gave him a chance to save his life by submitting. And he's just done so, and is now congratulating his opponent. Honour on both sides, that's rather lovely to see. And now the Yorkist army is surging forward once more. It's repeating its tactic of the full attack with King Edward leading from the front. And some of the Lancastrians are deserted. Some of the gunners are deserted. They're yes. actually going back through the Yorkist lines. Yes, this That's does not mental. look good for Lancaster. Can Lancaster hold this one? Oh, in he goes. Look. Bang. Yes. Right there. The rest King of the Edward. army advancing at a steadier pace. King oh. Edward is right there in the Lancastrian centre and the rest of his entire army following behind. Both sides now desperate, both preparing for the final act of the drama and the tragedy. From what we understand from the very slight records that exist, this is one of the very few reenactment battles which is almost fought in real time. The actual battle itself only lasted about just over an hour, I believe. Yes, you can't fight for much more time than that in heat and equipment like this. But if you look at both armies, you can see how perilously broken the Lancastrian line is compared with the solidity of the Yorkist one. The damage done to Lancaster in the earlier fighting, the slobby match, looks pretty severe. In front of this man. Oh, the York now the look. Yorkists, yes, the Yorkist army are going My to full-scale charge in the centre. 
moving as fast as possible, hitting Lancaster with maximum impact. And the rest of the Yorkist army advancing on both wings to match it. You could actually hear the thump as they hit each other there. Yes, that's as fast as anybody can move in armour. And the uh, Duke of Gloucester's men just going in there with a good steady pace. They're going to do a good job of work here because that's what they do. And Somerset tried to lead a wedge in to run a hole through them, succeeded. Somerset now apparently leading the field. Yes, he's running. For he's running life. away. Yes. He's scarpering, legging it. Yes. In the direction of the Abbey. I know what he's doing. He's taking sanctuary. He is. Sensible. The cowardly rat. And leaving his men to die. And if your commander abandons his post, there's not much hope for the men. And you can see Somerset's men being felled like ripe feet. Now their commander has gone. Their bodies littering the ground in the centre. The Lancastrian line is collapsing. It's blatantly clear now who's lost. A number of the Lancastrians now actually being chased off the field into the arms of the river. The only question now is whether the young prince can get away. His battle is lost, his army is collapsing, but he is the hope of an entire royal family. And if he can only get to safety, then there'll be another war, another time between the two sides. Each proudly displaying their banners, though Edward the victor has more banners and the prince just one. And now the bodyguards are going forth against each other. These are champions once again, people skilled in single combat with both the ancient, the modern, and the medieval sense. However skilled they are, it's still. And now the prince is challenging the king to single combat once again. Remember when they tried this before, the prince did extremely well. And the king is too proud to refuse. But his bodyguard goes forth. The prince take, tackles Edward's bodyguards. Edward the King has just delivered the ultimate insult to the teenage boy. He's told him he wasn't the son of his father, that his mother had produced him with the Duke of Somerset. That is something that no red-blooded prince or no red-blooded person can ignore. You've seen the Duke of Somerset, I mean. And now they're going to fight to the death. bleeds out his life. The top this is a customer service announcement. I think that's our cue, wifey. I think it might be. I think that's our cue to go. Get back to the bike. Yeah, let's go.